And um, I, I think, I think Jerry, number one, just thanks so much for letting Jake and I come on and, and spend some time. With you. There we go. Spending some time with you and Maya. Uh, it's just great to be with you. I, I think it would be a, a little beneficial just to give a little background about who we are and, and, and kind of why we are and why we came to be. Um, as many of you who know us know, and if, if you don't, you don't know, we're, we're actually uh, partners with Kevin O'Leary um, in this tax hive business. And the way that this kind of all kind of came together was that for years we had serviced small businesses in, in a few different uh, venues. And, and, and we, we saw this tremendous need um, for our clients to, to be serviced in the tax, tax planning and tax services world. And um, we, we knew there was this niche that was just missing for the investor, for the small business owner. So we went to Kevin and we pitched him on the idea. And um, interestingly enough, Kevin had owned a tax firm just like this previously. So when we pitched him, he said, Chris, this is a great idea. Uh, he's a big believer in small business, as you, as you guys can understand and imagine. And at the end of the day, Kevin sees firsthand how many of his clients, when he begins working with them, just don't take advantage of the tax benefits that are there. So, so his DNA really runs through our, our business. Uh, this idea that we believe small business is what keeps this country going, that investors like you are what keep this country going, that, that you're the fuel that fuels what we do here. And so that's kind of how we came to be. And that's our focus. Uh, our focus really is to help investors, to help business owners take advantage of the full offering of what the tax code has to offer. Um, Jerry, you might hate me, but I, I know you won't because I know you're big on being compliant, but um, our, our lawyers, we're gonna share some information. We're gonna actually share some real client studies. And because of that, they always ask me to share a, a brief um, just overview or, or disclaimer. So the presentation is brought to you by Tax Hive. The information contained is educational and is not intended to provide individual legal, financial, tax, or investment advice. Any case studies, examples, and hypothetical scenarios are used for illustrative and educational purposes. You should not view these examples as common, typical, or expected. And before making final decisions or implementing any financial strategy, consider obtaining additional information and advice from licensed professionals that are fully aware of your individual circumstances. In short, we're going to share a lot of, of, of examples um, of ideas that, that you can implement to reduce your tax liability. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of ideas out there. They don't all apply to everybody. I hope this gets your juices going today. I hope this gets you thinking about where you're at and what you can do differently to reduce your tax liability and, and put more of your hard money, hard-earned money to work for you. And at the end of the day, if if not every strategy applies to you. I promise there are strategies that apply and working individually is where you're going to find those strategies. So I've just talked a lot. Uh, so I, I want to let Jake, you know, kind of chime in here. Um, Jake, you run and manage our entire tax team and our tax planning group. And, and I, I think it would be great for you to help everybody understand how we're different in the approach and why planning matters in the approach to reducing taxes um, for everybody on here today. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, anyone, I should hesitate to say anyone, but almost anyone can, can check the boxes at tax time and, and do at least like an okay job, you know? And do we, you know, look at previous year's tax returns and, and find things that were missed? Yes, all the time. But, you know, real real tax savings is only achieved when it's implemented throughout the year. So, you know, we work with our clients and we put an actual tax plan in place for them that's specifically built uh, based on, on their, their situation, their business or businesses um, and them individually. And so, you know, what you do now impacts what you pay in taxes without a plan, you automatically pay too much. It's, it's pretty crazy. You know, we've surveyed thousands of business owners and found just on average, there's, there's about $50,000 in missing or potential deductions uh, that they miss just because of not planning and implementing. And so it's really, you know, where we pride ourselves is the, the difference between tax planning and, and tax prep, you know, not picking on anyone here, I promise, but, you know, tax preparation is, is showing up with 
a stack of papers and a box of receipts a, a few days before the deadline, you know, tax planning is, think of it right now, we're, we're in June, right? And so for, for most people, the last thing they're thinking about is their taxes, but that we're halfway through the year. Like what you do right now affects what you're going to pay next year. And so it's really the difference between tax preparation and tax planning uh, is where we, we pride ourselves the most. So. And I, I think the one thing that I, I would just kind of point out there, um, I, if, if there's anything that I hope you take away from our time together today, as much as there might be a fun strategy that you haven't heard of or that you implement, that's great. I actually think this is the piece that I hope everybody takes away today. And what, what I'm getting at and driving at is that what you do today is going to impact your taxes at the end of the year. And what you do throughout the year is what's going to put you in a position to either save money and take advantage of the tax code or not. And, you know, I, I know, Maya, you see this year round in bookkeeping, right? This is what you do. You know that what happens and what what, what we do today is what impacts things. And, you know, if you think of it, we're halfway through the season. Now's the time to make in-game adjustments. Uh, like Jerry said, we would love to earn your business and, and, and be the group that tells you what adjustments to make. But even if you don't use us, I hope everybody takes away from today that it's time to make in-game adjustments and go out and actually start doing things to help reduce that tax liability at the end of the year. So, so with that kind of setup, um, let's jump into some of the things that we, we see and that we hear um, people hitting us on so frequently, Jake. So the first thing that I, I want to hit you on um, is just simply going to be in the world of COVID with what we have going on, home offices just continues to be something that everybody wants, that everybody's using. What do we need to be aware of when it comes to home offices? What do we need to be looking at? What do we need to be thinking about? What blind spots do we have? Just talk us through home office deductions for a minute. Yeah, and to, to your point, I mean, they're, they're more common now than, than they've ever been. They, uh, what was that company the other day, She Sheds, they actually specialize in building separate buildings for people in their backyards that are, that are become their home offices, you know? So uh, the, the whole key to a home office is it has to be a separate area exclusively used for business. And so, you know, I we tell our clients, this can't be your, your dining room table, you know, where you eat dinner with your family. And then once the kids go to bed, you pop open the laptop. Uh, you know, it can't be your, your guest bedroom where people spend the night on the weekends and those sort of things, but you've also got a desk in there. It's got to be a separate area exclusively used for business. And, in, and if it is, and you do qualify, uh, we come up with what's called a business use percentage, which you'll probably hear that term several times as we're talking through the deductions today. Uh, but your business use percentage is calculated by taking the total square footage of that separate area divided by the square footage of the entire home. And you come up with a percentage and it's typically somewhere between like eight and 12% is pretty common. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of people don't realize if you do the, the actual method of the home office deduction, you can take that percentage of, of a lot of things. If you own the home, you can take that percentage of your real estate taxes and mortgage interest. Um, if you rent the home, that percentage of your rent, you know, utilities, repairs and maintenance, um, furniture, you know, things that you need to buy to, to actually furnish the home office. And, you know, then things like improvements to the property too. A lot of people don't realize, you know, you, you can't, you can't put a roof on all of your house, but the home office, you have to put the roof on the whole building. So you can actually depreciate the cost of that, uh, divided by your business use percentage over time. And so, you know, we tell clients, you're, you're, you're probably not going to save a million dollars this year on a home office deduction, but this stuff adds up. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're going to show a case study or not, but this is routinely five, eight, ten thousand dollars a year in deductions that people simply overlook because they're, and I don't know where it's coming from. A lot of, we, we hear it almost every time we do one of these presentations is, you know, my old accountant told me a home office is a red flag. And I, I couldn't disagree with that more is, is if you qualify for the home office, you should absolutely take it every day of the week. So. Jake, let me ask you just to clarify a couple of things in relationship to the home office, because um, one of the things that, that we get hit up a lot when we hear this is, well, hey, I thought I could just take my square footage and times it by a few bucks and get a deduction, right? And, and people are referring to the simplified method. And we get asked all the time, which is better? So I think it'd be great to just spend 30 seconds on explaining what the simplified method is and then answering the question, which I know is a loaded question, which one's better, right? 
You know, I love those. I love that question. So uh, the answer is it depends, right? And so the what I just described, that's the actual method. We take the actual expenses divided by the business use percentage and we, we total them up. Uh, what Chris is referencing is the simplified method, which the IRS says you can get $5. We, we still have to qualify. So I have to have this separate area, but you can get $5 per square foot up to 300 square feet for a one-time per year deduction of 1500 bucks if you don't want to have to track everything. But you know, typically what we see is the actual method is, is more beneficial, but yeah, if you don't want to track it or mess with it, it's $1,500 deduction right there. So. Nice. So looking at this, Jake, like you said, I, I do want to go through an actual example of a client and, and I just want to show everybody how this really works and, and the type of dollar figures that we're really talking about here. Um, and again, I think this comes back down to this idea of, hey, it might be really easy to take the $1,500 deduction, but with a little bit of energy and just a little bit of work, can I come out much better? Um, a little so bit of bookkeeping. Is, yeah, and a little bit of bookkeeping. That's <laughs> on track. Maya, um, you're one of us. I, I, I love that. Yeah, I am. So Sarah um, runs a real estate business with an income of $92,000 a year. She uses the home office deduction figured out the square footage. It was a business usage percent of 9%. So we looked at it. We took real estate taxes, taxes, mortgage interest, utilities, improvements, equipment, furniture. And long story short, this one strategy equated to a deduction of $6,273 for the year. Now you, you look at that as $6,200, $6,300 deduction. Again, that, that may not be life altering money, but what's going to happen is you see as you lay strategy over strategy over strategy, year over year over year, these turn into real dollars, to significant dollars that you could be using to go and invest, to go and, and purchase assets, and, and, and to go do different things with that will would allow your wealth to grow differently, to grow quicker, and doing it with money that you're already paying the government. So again, something as simple as a home office deduction, Sarah walks away with the $6,200 um, tax deduction. These things add up and make a big difference year over year over year. Um, Jake, shifting gears, we, we get asked all the time, can I, is there a way that I can write off my health expenses? Both my insurance, but also, you know, if, I, if I've got a prescription, if I've got some, some things... What, what is there in the tax code that allows investors, business owners to go out and approach things a little bit differently um, to be able to take advantage of writing off those kinds of expenses? Yeah, there's a bunch of different, um, maybe not a bunch, but a handful of different options there. And the, the easy answer is, you know, if you're a business owner, then you should absolutely, one form or fashion, you should be writing off your, your health insurance costs, your, your health related costs. So you know, if you, if your, if your business is to the point where it makes sense to have a company plan, you know, you can have an actual corporate uh, health insurance plan where all of the uh, actual costs there are, are a deduction for you. And it's a benefit you can offer to your employees, uh, you being one of them there, you know, there's other, other vehicles like HSAs or HRAs, which is a, a health savings account or a health reimbursement account. And they have, they all have kind of different limits of how much you can put in there every year and how much you can spend and whatnot. But one way or another, just depending on your situation, you should absolutely be writing, writing these costs off. So, and, that, and that's one we see frequently missed, especially from newer business owners. You know, they're getting everything together. It's, it's a little bit of a whirlwind. So just to echo your point of, you know, the, the more you learn about this stuff, the better. And it, it, it really adds up uh, over time. It has a real compounding effect. So, yeah. Well, go ahead, Maya. I was just going to say that's one where we get a lot of business owners and they get a lot of conflicting information on whether they should write it off on their business side or their personal side and whether they should take every single medical expense or just the insurance. So if you want to clarify that for our audience, because I get business owners asking me all the time. Well, and that's a great question. The answer is, and I promise I'm not doing this on purpose, but it depends. It, it, it depends on what kind of entity you are. It depends on if you're taxed as an S corporation or not. Um, you know, and hey, if I could go on a rabbit hole, we could probably talk about this for the whole time, but I, I don't want to do that. Um, the, you know, what we, what we tell customers is like, let's, let's have a plan. So based on your entity, based on 
your level of income, what's going to make the most sense. So. Yeah. One, yeah. one thing that I think, I'll go ahead, Jerry. I was, I was going to say being in the insurance space myself, a lot of it, the confusion comes from some of those insurances usually can't be tax deductible, like life insurances and different things like that. So I think when people hear that insurance umbrella and they're not sure if health insurance is or isn't one of those things they can deduct. And so to Jake's point, the best thing you can do, you know, is teaming up with your bookkeeper, with your CPA and just saying, here's what I have. What can we do? And, and doing that plenty of time in advance so that they can start to figure out, okay, well, how can we make this work for your situation? Yeah. Yeah. And if you have a good bookkeeper, they will team up with your CPA to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So that way, you don't have bookkeepers saying one thing and the CPA saying something else. Hundred percent. Great records equate to great tax work. I, I mean, there's just no way around it, right? Mm. Um, one of one of the things that we talk about a lot is let's take something. You know, Jacob brought up this idea earlier that everybody's heard. It's a red flag. Don't take it. Um, you know, we've all heard that. I, I think it's crazy. If it's legal and if it fits within the code, we want to take it. The term that we use is, is it defensible? Meaning if I'm going to do something, do I have the documentation that if I get called on the carpet, I can easily prove what I need to prove and this isn't going to swallow up my life, which is where great bookkeeping and records comes into place or comes into play. Um, yeah. one, one, one thing I want to just clarify before we, we move on to the next question, Jake, is um, most people have heard of an HSA but not as many people have heard of an HRA. An, an HSA is something that you have to fund, you have to put money into, and then you can use that to purchase these qualified medical expenses, right? The prescriptions, doctors, co-pays, things of that nature. Depending on your situation, an HRA is what's called a health reimbursement account, which basically in, in your business, you set up bylaws that allows your business to reimburse for medical expenses. The business is able to take the tax write-off. The reason that that's a little different nuance is, number one, there aren't the limitations on how much I can reimburse. With an HSA, there are limits as to how much I can put in there. But, but in addition to it, I'm not having to, to, to load and then pull money out. I'm able to reimburse as expenses come along. They're both great tools, um, depending on your situation. There are some rules around HSAs needing to have high deductible plans, but they're both great tools depending on your situation that, that may or may not be right for you. Um, as business owners, Jay, we're, we're always trying to get better. We're always trying to improve. We're always trying to, to sharpen our sauce, so to speak. And we see a lot of business owners invest into training. Um, I'm, I'm not going to call it education, right? There's different rules around education. We don't want to think university, right? We want to talk um, specifically about training for my business. Can I write that off? And if so, how do I go about writing that off? Yeah, and that is a question we get quite often. If it's a, if it's a continuing education spent, uh, expense for a, a business that you're already in or an industry that you're already in and generating revenue, that it's 100% it, deductible. If it's education in a new line of business or in a new industry, um, typically can still be deducted, but it'll probably need to be amortized over a certain amount of years all just depending on the situation. So the, the, the education is very similar to the health insurances. It, it, and a lot of times, a lot of the stuff this is this way is there is a way to do it. It just depends on exactly what the situation is. And we need to have the conversation to walk you through exactly how it's going to work. So we um, have a lot of uh, HSA, HRA questions. I have one question too, or one point that something that comes up on the medical that I know we're about to go back to is um, business owners, they want to be able to deduct all that stuff for themselves. And I do have to remind them all the time that if you are saying that medical is deductible or you are calling it a business expense for you, then it also has to be applied for all of your employees. It has to be, mm -hmm. a, you know, an agreement. That's a plan that if you want to get your company to pay every time you go to the doctor, then that would have to apply to all of your employees as well. So you have to make that determination because sometimes you don't want that for all of your you don't want that expense for all of your employees as well. So that's something to keep in mind. And then I'll let Jerry start telling you all the rest of the medical questions. Yeah, we have some questions that just came in on the HSAs. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, is more on what you can use an HSA for. So the question is, do HSAs or HRAs apply to preventative care services 
Can you do things like chiropractic, massage therapy, acupuncture, et cetera, um, with an HSA or with an HRA? If it's prescribed by a doctor, then yes. Um, if, if not, typically no, it would be more aggressive uh, to try to include something like that. So, But okay. isn't it? Is a chiropractor count as a doctor if he prescribes it and he gives you a prescription with that? There we go. So yeah, chiropractor, yes. If the chiropractor prescribed you a massage or, or you know, diagnosed that you needed the massage, yes. If I'm just going every Tuesday afternoon because it feels good and I like to get my, my toes done, not necessarily. We do love our toes done. <laughs> Next question. Can you have both? Can you have an HSA and an HRA? Uh, yes, you can. There's limits on the HSA. Uh, as long as you don't exceed over there, then you could have both. Most people don't, they usually pick one or the other, but there's no rules against having both. So. Okay. Very good. Good question. And then one more question. This is, this is maybe one I'll lob over to Maya and Jake might be able to answer as well. Is there a suggested bookkeeping software or type of software that would suggest, um, that you would suggest for an investor that is getting their stuff together for bookkeeping? Um, I would say let's connect with Maya on that, Brad. Maya, if you want to answer that maybe, you know, towards investors, but Brad could connect with you for a call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I generally use QuickBooks online bookkeeping for everything these days. Um, if you are an investor, if, if you're talking about like an under 100,000 revenue, maybe like 50, 60,000 and you're not there yet, there's other software that you can use to track um, you know, what's a business expense and what's a personal expense. But if you're talking about legitimately, you own a business, you know, you're going to have a separate bank account for that. QuickBooks Online, I find is the best way to go. Not everyone always agrees, but um, that's my, my best bet. You could start with a really inexpensive one called QuickBooks Simple Start. I wouldn't do the QuickBooks Self-Employed. If, you, if you're going to mix your bank accounts, use a different software. But don't mix your bank accounts, have it separate, have a bank account for your business, have a bank account for your personal, have them separate and QuickBooks online. You can start with simple start and go from there. And then, yeah, we should probably talk Brad if you need help on bookkeeping. Yeah. Mike, Mike is in the chat. So Brad, Michael Kerrigan will send you a message and get you connected up with Maya for a call on that note. If you're watching and you get a message from uh, one of our staff members, that's Mike. And so he'll try and connect with you to see if you have questions, want to set up a call. We did have one last question on the HSA, and then I think we can move forward and I can answer this one. Can you have an HSA without a high deductible health plan? Um, answer that is no, you do need to have a high deductible health plan to use an HSA. Well, I just want to say, oh, Chris, this is great. It's like, we got a whole team here. It's normally oh, just fantastic. me and Chris. I, I, I love this. <laughs> I, I can just kind of sit back and uh, this is amazing, so. So I, I want to shift gears, and I'm going to bet that Jerry has some stuff to weigh in on this one, too. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, QRPs, Qualified Retirement Plans. So who can use a Qualified Retirement Plan? Let's maybe start there, Jake. And, and what are some of the different kinds of Qualified Retirement Plans that we can be looking at? Can, can yeah. we start with what is a Qualified Retirement yeah, Plan? Sure. Okay, because I, I I've heard of retirement plans, but what does it mean if it's qualified? The qualified retirement plan, uh, there's there's several different ones. And so the the easiest, kind of most common is, is an IRA, a traditional IRA, which is just an individual retirement account. Uh, so with those, you can put up to, if you're a business owner, you should have some sort of retirement plan. So uh, an uh, individual IRA, you can put up to $6,000 in there per year. And that money is, is a deduction for you. And then it's in this tax deferred vehicle growing over time. Once people's businesses get a, a little more successful, we typically recommend something like a SEP IRA, which is a simplified employee pension plan. And those, you know, there, there are more requirements as far as just due diligence and paperwork, but, and there's some things around salary and everything too, but with a, with a SEP IRA, you can put over $50,000 a year into these retirement plans. And we're, we're, we're shocked at just how many of our clients have never been told about them before. Um, and so that's a SEP IRA. You can put up to $58,000 in there per year. Then there's even like a solo 401k plan. So if you're the only employee- That's my favorite the, one. Yeah, the, these are amazing right here. And Chris has this, I don't know if we have time, but Chris has a good story about a solo 401k um, where if you're the only employee of your company, then you can, same, same number, you can put up to $58,000 per year 
into these plans and it's, it's a deduction for you uh, in that current tax year. And, and this money is now in a tax deferred vehicle, you know, growing over time. And so the cool thing with a solo 401k, if your spouse works in the business with you, then you can actually both contribute. You can put over six figures into this account um, every year. So those are just a couple to touch on right there. So, so okay. I think, and this is where uh, Jerry and Maya might have some fun with us, but people think of qualified retirement plans and oftentimes they think of mutual funds, right? That's, that's what mm -hmm. I've heard. What can I buy with the qualified retirement plan? Am I stuck there? What, what are my options with the qualified retirement plan? Yeah, that's a uh, great point. Yeah. So when you're, when you're doing a qualified retirement plan, you know, you have to realize that there is a difference between like, let's say the 401k, for example, a 401k is not a financial product. It literally is a section in the internal revenue code. Right. And so it's a plan that meets all of the, 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 you know, the, the dotted I's and cross T's of what the tax code says is allowed for you to be able to defer and deduct, you know, contributions to that plan. So a company can set up, you know, an adoption agreement for the plan that meets the IRS's codes and rules, and they can also hold custody of the funds, but it can be open-ended. So there's something called the self-directed 401k, um, where you don't have to put it in mutual funds. You can do things like buy real estate with it. You can do private lending. You can put life insurance into it. You can buy gold and silver. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that are options out there. Um, back in the eighties, the 401k actually was created by a guy named Ted Benna. And he did just that. It was just, you know, here's what the code says. Here's what we're going to do. It was a company only plan. Wall street kind of got their hands on it and hijacked it. And so they, they'll be the custodian and set it up, but then they'll limit you to only their funds. Right. So it's kind of like the feeder system, but then you can only pick off their menu. So if you self-direct it, your menu of options on what you invest in is very, very wide and unlimited. And those are two separate things. What I'm allowed to invest in versus just the nature of deferring money aren't necessarily the same thing. Wow. Great. Can I ask a question on that? So is there something, just because I'm still like this qualified retirement plan, is there a retirement plan that doesn't qualify for the IRS? And that's why it's called qualified retirement plan. Like, is there, if you like, I guess what we're saying is if you just decided to put money into your savings account for your own retirement plan, but didn't it's use any of the IRS rules, then that doesn't qualify as a tax deduction. That's a good way to define it. The, the qualified portion of it, and I'm sorry, you asked that before I kind of glanced over it. It's essentially a pension plan. So you nailed it where, you know, if I'm just saving money under my mattress, that doesn't qualify per the IRS. So okay. like the QRP term is just qualified gotcha. retirement plan, which means it's set up as a pension basically. So yeah. yeah. And it goes back to what you said, Maya, on the health plans is it's non-discriminatory, right? So it qualifies by the ERISA rules. It's offered to everybody. Um, and that's why I would get a tax deduction versus if I'm just the owner and I have a bunch of full-time employees, but I'm not including them, that doesn't qualify by, by the ERISA laws because I am discriminating and I'm not going to get the same benefits as a qualified plan would have. Gotcha. Good. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I got my sacred account through Jerry, so I know that he's got all that stuff under control. Cool. He takes care of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story, then I want to just show you two, two, two clients real quick on this one. Um, I, I remember th this was one of my early on realizations of how far off the mark I was. I, I remember early on in owning a business, I was sitting around a table with um, uh, some other guys that were friends and one of my buddies at the time um, told me that he put about $50,000 into a retirement plan. And I remember telling him, you can't do that. There's no way you can do that. You're not allowed to put that much money into a retirement plan. And he started to argue with me, Chris, you can. And, you know, I had an IRA or something at the time. I can't remember what it was, but I was, I was contributing a fraction. And, and I thought I was putting away as many dollars as I could um, tax deferred. And he laughed at me and he started to go through through the requirements for a solo K. And I realized that I met every single requirement for a solo K, but my accountant had never, ever, ever brought up this idea of being able to leverage the tax code to get more money set aside for, for me, for my kids, for my future. And I remember being so frustrated. And, and it, it wasn't that my, my accountant was a bad, a bad person. In fact, he's a great person, family, friend, but he just, he was in the wrong niche. You know, it's, it's kind of like my daughter just had ankle surgery 
So we started off with our primary care physician and he missed the mark completely. He's a great doctor, but it wasn't until we got with the specialist that was able to put us in the right place. And so I think, again, it's just making sure we align with, with the right people in the right place to get the right advice. Because this is the real power here when you begin to look to look at what's going on and you begin to look at the, the impact that this can and should have on your situation. So this is Jaden S., another client. He's in the medical field. Uh, he qualifies for a solo K. And Jake, I'm gonna, um, you were using last year's number, 58,000, 2022. Um, it's actually up to 61,000. So in his plan that we put together for him this year, we recommended he put $61,000 in. And again, where he's at, where he sits, he's able to do that. Well, here's the real number. That $61,000 contribution is a $24,400 savings in taxes. So let's just make sure we understand what this means. He's putting $61,000 in, right? But the reality is he's only putting $35,000 in and he's taking the $24,000 that he would have been paying to the IRS and he's putting that into the account. So, so he's actually not reducing his access to capital by $61,000. He's putting 35,000 in, taking 24 grand that he was gonna to pay to the IRS anyways, and now he's moving that into that investment account. So he's letting this $24,000 grow for him over time that he would have just been giving to the IRS. Now, eventually, certainly he might end up paying taxes on that depending on how he set it up. But imagine that extra $24,000 compounding year over year over year, what that does long term. Uh, another client, Stacy from Virginia, she's not quite um, on the same level, but she a mental health counselor with $165,000 in net revenue. Um, she only put in $9,293 into her SEP IRA, which was great. That was an actual tax savings of $2,044. But as we started breaking down the math and things for her, um, this coming year, she's going to contribute $25,000 for a tax savings of $5,500. So again, in her spot, she's taken $5,500 that, that has always been going to the IRS. She's now gonna get that into this retirement account for herself and allow that to grow year over year over year. Um, anything any of you would like to add to, to retirement plans before we, we kind of move on? Yeah, we had a couple of questions come in that I can field, but one of the big things that I wanna point out from an investment standpoint you know, investing is such an interesting topic. People get very, you know, I want to do real estate. I want to do this. What Chris just showed you, especially that first slide, I want to make sure we all understand this. He put in 61,000 and it yielded him $24,000 in tax savings. Guys, that's a 40% risk-free guaranteed return in year one, right? So I want to repeat that 40, so 24,400 is what he saved on 61 grand. So if you take that 24,004 and do the backwards math on that, that's a 40% yield off of that 61K, right? So when you think about investing, you want to go for your low-hanging fruit first. And, and this is one of those things. On top of that, the jade in here will probably invest the 61,000 and something inside the plan. There's further growth on top of that. But even if you just left it, that's 40% risk-free. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's such a good point too, because... You're so right, Chris. Um, so many CPAs are just doing tax prep and you, at the end of the year, you know, someone comes in with a box of stuff and they go, okay, here's your tax bill. And they don't know any of this stuff. And then they go, well, can't you make the tax bill lower? Well, no, but if you would go to a tax planner or a CPA that does tax planning, then you can make your tax bill so much lower for next year, but there's not a lot that you can do backwards to change history of what you did. So when anybody asks me, like, how do I make my tax bill lower? You go talk to a tax planner and figure out how to do all this stuff so that you can have a, a tax bill lower because it's, it's real hard. I mean, I know there's limits of whatever it is that you can do it until April or something, right? But for the most part, if you're coming to me in September and asking how to make my tax bill lower, you can't. You need to, you need to go talk to a tax planner, you go talk to Tax Hive, get it worked out for next year figure out what your investments are, you know? So that's why tax planning season, like Jerry reminded us is now. And I want to just, because that's the number one question I get. How do I pay less taxes? Tax planning. Like, can I get like it's, a big like bugle horn? When you wait too long, guys, it's kind of like trying to uneat calories, 
Like you already <laughs> had them. It's too late. You can't get those back, right? You cannot eat them again tomorrow, but you can't get rid of the ones you already had. I'm going to steal that line, Jerry. You can't uneat calories. I'm, I'm going to steal yeah, that Yeah, you can't line. tax plan for last year. The plan entails future. <laughs> Maya dropped something on you there that I don't know if you guys actually picked up on, but I think is, is actually a, uh, just an important little piece of information to have. You can actually fund the account um, after the year ends. This is one of the things you can actually do after the year ends. You can mm -hmm. fund the account after the year ends. You have to do it before you file your taxes. But you do have to have your plan set up before the year end. So while, while you can wait to fund it, you've got to have it in place. Um, Jerry, did you say there was a question or two around? Yeah. To hit? Yeah, a handful well, of questions. So the first I, one here I, is, um, oh, go ahead, Maya. Sorry. So when you say you have to have it done before you file your taxes, what if you have an extension for September, October? You just have to have it funded before then? Yep. Oh, good to know. Learn something new every day, guys. Fund that account and you still have a few months left if you already have it set up. It's one yeah, of the great exactly. things so, too, because you, you you can kind of look at where you were at and decide almost after the fact, hey, what am I able to put in and where am I able to be this year? Right. So it gives you time to do that. And I like the extension option for that reason. I think a lot of people, you know, they think the extension's a bad thing. They might even get nervous or worried about it. If I have, let's say, like, let's say like it's March or April and I could file on time but I know that I have the ability to do that solo K, but I just don't have, you know, liquidity for it or whatever. If I file the extension, that buys me time, right? Now I've got till October or, or whatever my filing deadline would be to still get money in that account. So as long as, again, if you're doing extensions, you know, you're working with the CPA team and that's part of your plan. Um, it's a proactive thing you can actually use as a strategy. Um, somebody asked, can you own life insurance inside of a solo K? So the quick answer is yes, there are a lot of rules with it, right? So you have to make sure that you follow that down to the T. Um, there are also taxes incurred because you have life insurance in the plan. You're considered to get a benefit at the current year when you put it in there. So you do get a deduction, but there are some taxes you're going to realize in that year. Um, another person asks, what is an investment grade insurance contract? Um, that's kind of a marketing gimmick phrase. There isn't actually such a thing. I hate to break it to you. Um, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means someone's probably just selling index universal life or whole life insurance with the marketing phrase on top of it. Um, Randy asks, can I do a sol solo 401k and make it self-directed? Um, the answer to that is yes. That's a sick strategy. If you can, if you can set that up, that's something we can help with as well. Um, I think we have one more. This is a good one for Jake and Maya. Do, do 401k contributions, solo 401k contributions, do they have to be done with business profit? Uh, so the solo, sorry, did you say SEP or solo 401k? Solo 401k. So they're, they're a little different. There's actually, and not to get too technical, but there's two sides of the contribution. There's the employer contribution, uh, then there's the individual contribution. So Technically, no, I guess there, there would be a way through bookkeeping if you wanted to invest the money in the company to, to put it in there, you could do that. Uh, but typically it is, yeah. Typically these are, you know, I'm making a ton of money. I made $400,000 last year. Do I want to write a check to the IRS or do I want to write it to my own retirement account? So I guess, it, can I just say one thing? So if you didn't, I mean, so what the IRS considers profit is not usually the same thing as what business owners consider profit because they're like, I don't have any money in my bank account. <laughs> There's no profit. What are you talking about? Well, yes, you spent, you transferred this money to your personal account or, you know, you spent it on personal items. So it was profit for your business. So I guess my question would be, or not even my question, my point would be if you do um, a qualified retirement thing, right, where you're going to have even if you had a negative on your net income at the end of the year, you're still fine. It's not like the IRS is going to question you and say, why did you, why did you lose money this year? Well, and just to clarify it, you're not going to be able to use those contributions to create a loss. It's kind of like right. similar it be, depreciation. It but, wouldn't give you a tax benefit, but you could do it if you wanted you to get the put money into it. Yeah. Jake, I've got one for you that just came in from Randy. He asks, can you do a SEP and a solo K? Uh, you can have both, but you, you couldn't contribute to both, essentially. The limits would still apply. Uh, so it, you couldn't contribute 58,000 to one and the 68,000 to the other one. So typically, people are going to pick one and, and run with that one. So 
Okay, good. And then we just had one come in. This is a little more complex on the life insurance side. Um, so he asked, Jerry, if you have a solo K, can you use the cash values to pay for the premiums or make a loan to pay taxes on, or do you pay taxes on loans? I think there's two questions. So if you put life insurance in a solo 401k, um, you can fund that. Like, again, it's very technical. You can use the contribution to fund the premiums. You have to make sure you're following the rules with that. Uh, one of the benefits of a solo K is you can take plan loans. So you can borrow against your solo 401k. That's a tax-free loan. You do have to pay yourself back typically at a reasonable interest rate over five years. So um, that is a good way to put in money, get a de deduction, and then be able to maybe use that for liquidity on an investment or whatever you want to do in your personal life. And then you just pay your plan back. Jerry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead real quick. I just saw a question come through that asked how they can get in touch. And so I'll just quickly tell people how to get in touch. And uh, it, it looks like they may need to get off. And then I'll, uh, we'll come back to some of the questions if that's okay. Great. Um, if you do want to get in touch with us, uh, you know, with, with our relationship with Jerry, uh, we offer a free strategy session for any of Jerry's referrals or Maya's referrals. Um, we have two things in place uh, with our relationship. Number one is, like we said, we've surveyed thousands of clients and we know that darn near everybody's missing deductions. So Kevin convinced us to put on a $10,000 guarantee. If we have a conversation and we can't find at least $10,000 in missing or potential deductions, we'll pay you a hundred bucks. Um, I'm not really interested in paying you a hundred bucks. I don't think we'll have to, but that is there. And then again, for anybody who goes and schedules today um, from here, We'll give you a free access to our digital book, The Top Seven Ways to Stop Leaking Money. Where you go to schedule that, if you want to pull out your phone right now, you could do it right now, is taxhive.com forward slash WD. That just stands for Wealth Dynamics. That way we know that you are you come from a referral from Jerry. Uh, you get those benefits. So you can go to taxhive.com forward slash WD. And uh, right there, you can just pick a time that works for you. This isn't just like a lead submission form where we'll, we'll call you. You'll actually get a calendar. You'll see the times. You'll pick a time. You'll schedule it in that works for you, and we'll give you a buzz. So uh, we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to chat with you. Go take a look at that um, if you have to run. Uh, let's get back into to some of these strategies, though. Um, I, 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 this, this is one, Jake, that I don't, I don't know we need to spend a lot of time on, but we get asked a lot about hiring kids. And, and can I hire kids? Why would I hire kids? What are the rules around hiring kids? That, that's a good one. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that one right there. And it's funny, I was actually the other day on the SBA website, they talk about this um, as a great strategy for people to employ, but a lot of people don't realize you can, you can hire your children. So uh, as, long as, as long as they perform an actual role in the business and you compensate them in line with fair market compensation for the role they're performing, uh, they could, they can work for you. And so a lot of people don't realize, uh, if that's their only income, you can actually pay them $12,950 a year. Cause that amounts under the amount of standard deduction where they, they wouldn't even need to file a tax return or pay taxes on any of that money. And so, you know, that's a, a really great strategy. And I actually, I, I pulled this article up cause I, I, I was dying laughing when I read this. It says on the SBA website, it says uh, your, your children may work any time of day for any number of hours, as long as they're working in your business. So they don't even, mo they don't even monitor how much overtime or what day or, or what time it is or any of that stuff too. So that's, a, that's a great strategy, especially people have three, four kids, you know, that stuff adds up. So, so we have a client that has seven children and they own a farm and all seven of those kids not only do they do the standard, but they also, they do an IRA as well. So the, on top yeah. of that, now they're like 18,000. Do, it does need to be legitimate work. And on a farm, it definitely is, but yeah. No, yeah, you can put that, yeah, in a, a Roth IRA with the children, you know, uh, under the children's name and that money's growing tax-free. We've, we've seen clients do that for a period of time and it funds, you know, college uh, tuition accounts. It funds, you know, weddings, that sort of stuff, travel, travel everything, so. Yeah, it's an absolute great strategy. So, is there well, any you know, reason? Sorry, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to do that, or any like red flags connected to that? So, watch out for. Yeah, what I tell people is it has to be legitimate. So, if you're, and it has to make sense, right? And so, I, I use this as example because a, it's a great example, but b, it's a good chance for me to pick on Chris too. Um, so, my my children are younger; they're four years old and two years old. I have two boys, so if I were paying them $12,000 a year saying, 
they cleaned my office, you know, twice a week or twice a month or whatever, that's, it's not going to hold water. It just doesn't make sense. Now, Chris being, you know, much, 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 much older than I am, uh, his, his <laughs> children are a little older. So I think you've got like a 16 year old and 18 year old, you know, those sorts of things. And so the activity that you're saying they're performing, it, it has to, it has to make sense basically. So I, I will add one caveat there. Um, true story, real story. My, my wife's a dance instructor. She danced ballet in college and I can't, I can't escape dance. I've got four girls and um, they needed to do a photo shoot for a number of ads for the dance studio. So we sent up, I think my daughter was three at the time and she participated in the photo shoot. And so again, just because they're young doesn't mean they can't work, but you've got to find a legitimate way to put them to work. And, and, and that's genuinely a way. And she is still in ads for the dance studio. In fact, her face larger than life is on the window of the dance studio. Um, so I think there are ways that you can look at even paying younger kids. Mm -hmm. You've just got to find the creative ways for it to be legitimate, which is a bit of a loose term, but, but legitimate. But if, um, you're, if you're a CPA, your kids can be making you coffee and bringing, being your assistant. They can do all the shredding and all the stapling if you ever still yeah. print things out. <laughs> Administrative stuff. I mean, there's, there's a, yeah, absolutely. So Jake, real quick, a client asked, can, can you do this with grandchildren? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not so much about the, the relationship, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it's more about if they don't have any other income, then it's, it's tax free to them because it's under that standard deduction amount. So yeah, you could do it with your friends, kids, I mean, whoever. So yeah, the reason you so often do it with your kids, right. Is that that indirectly benefits you. I mean, my kids yeah. can pay for their own dance lessons with money. I'm paying them. They can pay for their own school clothes. They can now all of a sudden there, there's dollars that aren't, aren't being taxed that we're using to fund the things that our families do, right? Which is a, a fun way to get at it. Um, I, I know we don't have a ton of time left, Jake, so I don't want to spend a ton of time, but I think there's two, two strategies that I, I really want to make sure that we hit um, before we let everybody go. Um, so I, I want you to talk about vehicle deductions and specifically talk to us a little bit about section 179 in relationship to vehicle mm -hmm. deductions. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great one right there. And so, you know, vehicle deductions, if you purchase a vehicle and it's used for business more than 50% of the time, uh, you can, you can depreciate the, the total value of that vehicle. And the, the cool thing about that is you can depreciate the entire value, uh, even though you still might be making payments on it. So there's a code section, uh, internal revenue code section 179 talks about if you buy a vehicle for business, it's over 6,000 pounds can actually depreciate the, the full amount of it uh, in the first, in the year that you place it in service. And so we see clients, you know, getting deductions of 70, $80,000, you know, these days cars have gone up so much, maybe a hundred thousand um, within the first year. And so this gives us a great opportunity for tax planning and then, you know, other opportunities moving forward too. And so. So that's why you hear this number, right? If I buy a vehicle over 6,000 pounds, I can actually accelerate that depreciation. That's where the section 179 kicks in. So under that, we can still write off vehicles, either take the actual expenses or the mileage, but that, that 6,000 pound um, number allows section 179 to kick in where you can accelerate that depreciation and you don't have to amortize it. Uh, interestingly enough, I think I saw the new Jeep Wrangler, I think it was, uh, that is the electric version, right? The, it, yeah. The batteries put it over 6,000 pounds. So if you want a, a Jeep Wrangler and you want to be able to accelerate that depreciation, go get the hybrid and you can actually take advantage of 179. I'll, I'll do you one better, Chris. The Porsche Taycan. It's a, literally a sports car. It weighs like 6,200 pounds because of that lithium battery. So then you can so, depreciate it and you can get the electronic vehicle credit on there. So not electro exactly. electric vehicle credit on there too. So all right. Um, one, one quick more. question here. I'll go ahead. So we have a question. How is the 50% use determined? How is that determined and documented? Uh, so um, in the very beginning, we talked about uh, home office and the business use percentage. So that's, that's the term that that goes by. So it's, it's essentially the total amount of time uh, that the vehicles used. And so if you, you know, if you're a real estate agent and you're, you're using the vehicle every day to travel and meet clients and show properties, it's going to easily qualify. If, uh, you know, if 
if I'm a, and just kind of making up examples, if I'm an online digital marketer and I are marketer and I only leave my house once every six months, it's, it's not going to qualify. And so it's, it just has to, to fall in line with the, the business use percentage. And then is our position defensible? So just yeah, kind of give a little, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Maya. I was just going to say QuickBooks Online has an app. Somebody put in the comments a, a tracker, a mile tracker. But if you're using QuickBooks Online because you're already doing bookkeeping, you can just get the app and it has a built-in mileage tracker. So you just and turn it on when you're driving or you enter it in after you arrive. But those, then you can, it's, it's a really good idea to use the mileage tracker. That way you're not guesstimating, you have exact numbers, and then it makes it really defensible as Jake said. Yep, absolutely. Those are great because they'll track your total mileage automatically. You just go in and pick which routes work for business. And you can easily, um, easily understand it at the end of the year. So, one thing I'll point out too: you talk about business use percentage because you're really, you're only going to be able to take the percentage of the vehicle usage. Um, so, what we do see clients do though when they're implementing 179, um, because it's the year the vehicle is placed in service, you can take oftentimes the entire amount. They'll go buy a car in December, yep. right? And in December, they're going to be super diligent about tracking those miles and having that because that's the time frame that they're going to look at. The year that that vehicle is in service, it was whether it was a month or 12 months, if you have to, to produce those records, that's what you're going to have to produce. So that's a, a little strategy. The only other thing I'd say about vehicles before I, I hit this last strategy, which is one of my favorites, um, is when, we, when we're talking about taking that that depreciation in one year, it doesn't always make sense to take it the first year, even though you can, you know, especially you know, if you're yeah. talking some of these real expensive vehicles, it might make more sense to take a portion now and a portion later. So those are just things you wanna be aware of and you wanna look at. Um, Jake, this is the one that I, I just, I can't believe more people don't know about it. Um, talk to us. Talk to us about the Augusta rule. My pride and joy. This one warms my heart here, Chris. And so this is uh, nicknamed the Augusta rule, which actually came from a, I've never verified this, but the, the old wives tale is uh, the, back in the 70s, the residents of Augusta, Georgia, uh, that lived on the fancy golf course where the, the Masters tournament is every year. They could, they could rent their houses out for, you know, 10, sometimes $20,000 a night when they're right by the, the, where all the action was for the players and stuff. And so they actually lobbied to the IRS uh, to get this rule passed. And so it's actually Internal Revenue Code Section 280A says, as a taxpayer and as a homeowner, you can rent your home out up to 14 times per year and the, the income derived from that activity is tax-free. And so there's two main ways we see this used. I'm sure there's a couple other ones if we wanted to get real creative, but you know, the first one is if you, you have a nice home or just have a home in an area that's, you know, commonly rented, or let's say the Super Bowl is coming to town, uh, you could rent your home out uh, for up to 14 days. And however much money you bring in from there, you, you don't even need to report it. Uh, where we really commonly see it used is as business owners. So as a business owner, your, your business can rent your home from you for a specific business purpose. And it has to be in line with fair market values or going market rates for a similar property or venue. Um, but if you do, you can, your business can rent your home for from you for marketing events, networking yeah. events, uh, board meetings, those sorts of things. And uh, you can do it up to 14 times per year. That money is a deduction from the business and it's tax-free to you as the, the homeowner. So brilliant that rule right there. 14 times, meaning can it be more than one day or is it 14 times meaning one day? Uh, 14 nights based 14, 14 yeah, nights. So you could do it two weeks straight, or you could do the most common we see done is like once per month or once per quarter. Um, so it, it, there's no rule of, it has to be in succession or spread apart. So cool. So, so just quickly want to show you again, an example and the real impact this has uh, Scott from Florida actually owns a number of different businesses. Uh, Jake, I believe this is actually your client. Is that right? He, yeah, and well, just to kind of back to Maya's, the, I remember this example. I, I like this one. He, he had three or four different businesses. So he did his quarterly shareholders meetings at his house, but he staggered them. So for Jan, you know January and April was X business, February and May. So every month he would have these, uh, and he had this beautiful house right on the water. You see like dolphins doing this in the water and stuff. 
Um, so, but yeah, I'll let you tell it. This is a great one right here. So, well, you, you hit most of it, right? So, you oh, sorry. These, no, you're great. You use it for these meetings. When you looked at the market rate, the market rate in his area was $1,500 a night. He actually didn't cap out all 14 nights, which I thought was interesting, but at 12 nights at 1500 bucks, that right there equated to an $18,000 tax deduction. Wow. So this was something that he was already using his money. He was just going and renting out a conference room somewhere doing something. So it was money he was already spending. So that once Jake showed him what he could do, he went and started just paying himself. Where all of a sudden, he's now collecting $18,000. His business is taking an $18,000 deduction. He's not having to claim that income. So, you know, I think, again, some of the lessons today are we've talked about a lot of strategies, and a lot of these strategies do apply to most of you. But, but if not, there are strategies that apply. And as you layer you know, it doesn't take a lot. You layer four or five or six strategies on top of one another year over year over year, that can equate to tens of thousands of dollars that you can then go do the very things that Jerry trains and teaches and preaches on all day long that then allows you to, to accumulate and grow your wealth in a better, more effective way. Um, the last thing I'll share, and then Jerry, is certainly that you have final word or Jake or whoever you want to run it, but Again, we would just love the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation and, and see what we can do, if anything, to help you. And if we can't, that's okay, too. I really believe we can help people, though. We've done this long enough. Um, the way that we approach where we're not just going to do taxes, the first step for any client that we onboard is we're going to actually create a plan. We're going to have you upload your taxes. We're going to have you take an in-depth questionnaire. And we're going to create an actual written plan that says, hey, here's what you need to go do to implement. Um, because of that, I'm confident that we can find those potential deductions. Um, go to taxhive.com forward slash WD, and uh, we'll give you that free book as well. You'll get an email with a free download to the, the Stop Leaking Money. My final plea to you is this. Um, like we talked about at the very beginning, what you do now actually really does impact your taxes. Uh, just simply burying your head, ignoring it doesn't do it. So make this your first step in taking control of your taxes. R right now, before you get busy and go do something else, pull out your phone, jump on your browser. It'll take you less than two minutes, taxhive.com forward slash WD, and let us help you take control of your tax situation. Uh, we would love the opportunity to work with you and help you out. Awesome. Awesome. We'll kind of wrap up. I have one last question for Jake on the previous, on the, on the Augusta. Can yeah. someone do that if they rent? Do they have to be a homeowner or can they do that with an apartment or a house that they rent? Um, you can do it. Yeah. It would just have, you don't have to own the home. It's just what you would pay for the actual venue. So we, we had a guy who traveled around and he would rent locations in different markets that he went to and would, would implore that strategy too. So very cool. Awesome. Yep. So guys, we're going to wrap up here. Um, as Chris had said, schedule a consult. If you go to taxhive.com forward slash WD, you can also reach out to Michael in the chat. Um, thank you guys, everyone for tuning in. And I do want to stress like this, as Chris said, this is tax planning season. It's happening now, right? So this is where it starts. It's going to end pretty much beginning of December. So between now and December, this is the time to plan, implement, get all of that done so that when the end of the year happens and you've talked to Maya and she said, here's your PL and here's your books, go file. There isn't you know, trying to uneat the calories. We've already done everything we need to do. And we actually just, it's easy. There's no stress at tax filing season at that point. So connect with us. Um, Jake, Chris, Maya, do you guys have anything else you want to wrap up with before we close out? What Jerry said. Um, also, I would say, you know, on bookkeeping and on taxes, if you come last minute, you're going to not get it done the time that you want it done. So now is the time to do the tax planning. Um, if you don't have bookkeeping going yet and you go to Tax Hive with a box, they're not going to be able to help you that much. So you're going to want to get your bookkeeping in so you have the data, the reports, the information they need to be able to do tax planning and tax filing. So now is the time to do that. Now is the time to get your bookkeeping set up. Now is the time to you know talk to Tax Hive so you find out everything that they need. Because if you come, you know, in if you haven't done your 2021 books yet and you come to any of us in September for your S corporation, 
you are going to be in a world of hurt because the likelihood that it'll get done in one week is very close to zero. So we're already mid-June. If you don't have 2021 done, like do it now. Do tax planning for 2022. But if you don't have 2021 done, now is the time if you haven't done it. Amen. I, I would just say, Jerry and Maya, thanks for having us. We're just appreciative of the opportunity to work with you. I love working with you and your clients. And uh, thanks for giving us the time and, and uh, for your trust. Yeah, awesome. Thank, thank you guys so much. If you guys have questions in the chat, you can connect with Mike. We'll leave the room open, but uh, we'll wrap up here. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank See you later.